Welcome back. I'd be entirely deficient and irresponsible if I didn't discuss pressures and headspace uh, in my first section. Uh, in the introduction, I uh, related to you that I was going to give you step-by-step -step instructions in uh, hand loading, and that's what I intend to do, and it's important so that you understand uh, the, the significance of pressures. Just as pressure is our lifeblood, that's the lifeblood of a firearm. Bullets cannot project from a barrel at any velocity whatsoever without pressures. Pressures are very well regulated in the industry. Uh, there are pressures which are uh, necessary to generate the velocities that are required for that particular cartridge, and there are excessive pressures, and then there are minimum pressures. Uh, but they have to. There is a defined limitation. Those pressures are something which every hand loader has to adhere to. Um, there have been so many discussions that I've run across on various threads on the internet relating to pressures that I can tell that the, the people who are talking about it are very unfortunately misled by other people who have been misled and there's so much bad information out there that you can't even possibly begin to uh, understand what's going on if you're watching it. Um, there's there's a, a huge misconception that the there's, there's even writers that I've seen uh, on, you know, people who should know better, uh, who their, their names are well known, uh, they have published books, uh, they, have, they have published websites uh, who give extremely bad information with regard to uh, pressure signs. One of the things that I see uh, very frequently is somebody writing up that they, they keep on uh, going up a ladder test until uh, they start seeing uh, blown primers and then they back off a little bit. They'll specify how much they back off or they go up to a certain point where the bolt sticks and then they back off. You know, the very time that they, their primer is blown, they have damaged their gun. I mean, we're not only talking about being excessive pressures, we're talking about actually doing physical damage to a fine firearm. <coughs> the concentration of hot gases coming out of a small primer hole uh, is far different and far more far more concentrated than it is coming out the front of the the front of the cartridge uh, case. I'll give you an example. If you if you have a garden hose and you just and you just run the hose without a nozzle on the end of it, you've got a three quarter inch rubber hose with with a brass nozzle and it just runs out at full flow. It just drops out. That's Consider that to be the open end of the cartridge case, but then you put on your then you put on your driveway cleaning nozzle, which is a very fine pinhead nozzle that shoots it out. It's the same amount of water, it's the same amount of house pressure and everything else, but it's coming out a much smaller hole. And you shoot it at your driveway. You know that if you stick it at one spot long enough, you'll actually dig up pavement with it if you're close enough. Well, this is what's happening with blown primers. Blown primers, rather than having uh, rather than having a hole which is 30 caliber or 270 caliber or whatever the caliber is, now that gas is spurting out uh, a very small hole uh, or maybe around a, maybe at a small pinhole on the edge of the primer. That small pinhole is a, emitting uh, hot gases under extreme pressure uh, in a very concentrated spot and it'll burn a hole right through your bolt. I have seen I have seen bolts ruined by this process. I have seen bolts that have been the, a, a circle around the, pri the firing pin has been actually cut out, and, and the bolts are no longer usable. Uh, this is from people who uh, engage in this absolutely asinine practice of raising pressures until they start seeing uh, signs, so-called signs of pressure. Signs of pressure are not a good thing. You don't want to see. You don't want to see pressure indications. The only pressure indication you should see is the one that shows that you fired the cartridge. Um, I'll show you a. You should not. You should not experience uh, difficult bolt lift. Uh, you should not use that as a pressure indicator to uh, find out what the ceiling is for your rifle. When you if you run into that, then you have to back off automatically. Back off ten. Back off ten percent. You know, if you're talking ten percent of a 30-grain uh, cartridge, a cartridge which is capable of holding up to 30 grains of powder. Backing off 10% is only 3 grains. And then 
gradually approach it a little bit, a little bit more, and stay away from that point where you know that you ran into high pressures. You should never experience anything like that. The very first thing that you will notice with any cartridge is uh, a flattening of primers from the norm. First thing you should do is to uh, know what your cartridge looks like uh, when it's fired by a fa with a factory, cart a factory cartridge. Know what that uh, cartridge should look like and use that as an uh, indicator. So if you, if you buy a box of, uh, say, Winchester 308s, and uh, you know you, you you fire them. Look at the primers and see what the primers look like when you're done shooting. In almost all cases, you're gonna, you're going to notice you're going to notice that the I'll show you three three separate uh, shots here. One is this is an unfired primer right, unfired primer right here. You can see that the radius at the edges of the uh, primer are very round. And on the next one, you can see that the radius on the the center one, the radius on the primer hasn't changed. The, the radius on the primer is still rounded. On this one, however, you notice that the radius on the primer is gone. It's flattened out and it has filled up, it has virtually filled up the bevel uh, between the case and the primer. This one here is approaching absolute maximum pressure. This one happens to be a safe, this one happens to be a safe load for the 7 millimeter 08 because this is, what, this is what a standard factory round looks like when it's done shooting. But there is still some, there is still some beveling that's apparent around the edge of the primer. But there's no, need to be, there's no need to be firing a cartridge at even that uh, pressure level. Dropping back a, a, a couple of thousand uh, pounds of uh, pressure per square inch, uh, means that you're going to have much longer case life. You're only going to be dropping back perhaps 25 or 40 feet per second of velocity, and you're going to have a, a gun that will last a lot longer. Um, stay away from high pressure is not high. Excessive pressure is not a good thing for you. It's certainly not a good thing for your rifle. And it to try to crowd velocities, to try to eke out. Uh, an additional 50 or 100 feet per second velocity even uh, really means, materially, it means nothing. It means absolutely nothing in real terms. Um, it's, remember now, we're, we're, in a, we're in a commercial, we're in a free commercial world. Uh, the, guy who, the guy who appears to come over the finish line sooner uh, is the winner. So if, if a uh, published, if, if published literature shows that a particular 270 load is running at about 30 or 40 feet per second faster than his competitor's 270 load. He's the winner. It's just it's just the way it works. In real terms, it only means that it's a it, it perhaps gains uh, a, a quarter of an inch at you know 100 yards maybe. Uh, it might mean gaining a, a half inch at 200 yards maybe. Uh, these are insignificant amounts that, that really don't amount to anything, and so you, there's no need whatsoever to try to eke out an additional 50, uh, 75, or even 100 foot, uh, feet per second of pressure. So relax on that, and don't, don't, uh, don't get dismayed because you're working with a velocity which is not the top one in the book. You don't have to work with the top one in the book to still be working with the cartridge stamp that it says if you've got a if you've got a 22 250 and you know you're working with a 55 grain bullet and uh, you know you you've got a full case of powder and you've got nice rounded primers believe me you've got a lot of power going on out there there's nothing you don't have to sweat it and you're not you're not working at deficient levels so that's the first thing I want to talk about with regard to pressure um, under, under all circumstances, adhere to uh, manufacturers' published data. There are, there are different sources for published data. data. Uh, the most basic sources, and they're extremely good sources, is uh, from the uh, powder manufacturers. Each of the powder manufacturers, when they, when they uh, market their product, whether it's Alliant or uh, Hodgdon, uh, Olin, you know, Winchester Olin now is owned by Hodgson. Uh, IMR, which used to be uh, Improved Military Rifle Powder, uh, that years ago was a DuPont product. Uh, that was that was one of the original powders in this country. 
Uh, that's now owned by Hodgson, but there's published data for all these uh, powders, and the manufacturers give it out for free. They don't charge you for these. They don't charge you for these guides. So that's the most. That's the most basic. You can, regardless of what you're loading, you can you can turn to a you can turn to a page and you can uh, see exactly uh, what it is that. Uh, you're loading and it gives you the exact data. Don't just flip to the page that has your cartridge in it and uh, pick out the uh, pick out a load and then start shooting it. If you read the beginning of the manual and these these books presume that you read the first page and the first page will tell you that all data should begin with a 10 percent reduction from the loads listed. So start with start with a 10% reduction in the loads listed, and I would say that the only the only the only difference in that is with regard to shotgun shot shell loads. Shot shell data is uh, rock solid. They specify exactly the primer to use, the shot cup to use, uh, and all those things. And that's all reloading too. You know, reloading is not just brass cartridge cases, uh, but with regard to uh, shot shell loads. Uh, though you're working with a thin barreled shotgun, they burst very, very easily. It doesn't take much at all. You get a little, there's no such thing as pressure signs with a shotgun. You get a, you get a shotgun that uh, is working one day, and then the next second you get a shotgun that you take to the dump. It's just as simple as that. Uh, I've seen burst shotgun barrels. They happen very quickly. When you're dealing with shot shell loads, you always adhere to the data which is listed in every single instance. If you have a primer that's not listed, don't use it. Uh, it. Look look through all the data and I recommend that you can get something more comprehensive like the Lyman loading data uh, or contact the primer manufacturer and, and ask them, you know, email them or call them on the phone and they'll tell you. They have, they have all the data necessary for every possible combination of uh, wads and uh, case sizes. Internal dimensions of cases with shot shells is very specific. Uh, they, they have widely varying inside internal dimensions, which changes the powder uh, chamber and the, the effective pressure. Uh, so getting back to, um, getting back to uh, smokeless powder cartridges with regard to um, brass cartridge cases, uh, always start at 10% below maximum. So uh, here's a 3006 load. Uh, say, for instance, I'm loading 150 grain bullets with a 3006 and I want to use uh, CCI 200 primers. Um, they they have a load here that says Reloader 19. That's a that's a particular that's a particular brand and type of powder that they market. So Alliant has a powder called Reloader 19 with a uh, with a charge weight of 62 grains and it has a C beside it, which means compressed. With a charge of 62 grains, uh, it, it lists a specific velocity of uh, 20, 27, 22. That's a that's a fabulous velocity for deer hunting, by the way. Uh, it's not overly destructive. It'll it'll put a it'll put a deer down in a heartbeat. Um, he's not going to be moving around very much after he after he gets struck with that with a vital shot. Uh, but you want to drop back instead of 62. You want to drop you want to drop back 10 percent. So there'd be uh, that, very simply, just take 10% of 62. You drop back six. You can drop back 6.2 grains uh, and start from there, and that will give you a good starting point. And you work up from there. Um, and when you when you work up, you and this is so-called ladder test. I call it incremental intra, incremental testing. Uh, you just move the decimal point over. So the 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 each. Uh, each increment should go up at the rate of approximately a half a grain. When you're talking a 3006 size case, it should go up each increment a half a grain or so. In this case, if you want to be specific, you could say you could go up uh, six tenths of a grain in each increment. And when you finally arrive at the at the increment that seems to be working with your rifle and you, you you're getting good accuracy, that's that's the indicator of a very efficient load is good accuracy. Don't, however, confuse it with the accuracy that can sometimes occur with an overpressure load. You know, some people will say, well, I run my gun a little over pressure because I get good accuracy. Well, you might be, you might be in fact, getting good accuracy, but that not, notwithstanding that, you, you can be destroying your gun soon. Um, the, the, reason why, the reason why accuracy can change 
throughout its range of powder weights. If you're working, if you're working through a range of six grains of powder, for instance, up to maximum, uh, and and remember, you can reach maximum before you hit what's listed in the book, uh, and be aware of that. If you start noticing, if you start noticing that you suddenly are experiencing a, a sharp increase in recoil, just because you went up a half a grain, step back a half a grain from the last one. Um, if you if you're working with if you're working with a load and all of a sudden you notice that the primer just suddenly flattened, back off a half a grain from the last one. You don't want to be working anywhere near that circle, that ceiling. Uh, but you know when a barrel when a barrel fires, it's like an oscilloscope. It 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 doesn't just snap back. It it actually flexes because it's tapered, and that that taper means that it 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 flexes like a fly line, like a fisherman's fly line. It, it, it's a different taper. And that's called, it's just like an oscilloscope. There's what they call nodes and overtones. This is the overtone and this is the node. The one that's closest to the point where it doesn't move much or, or remains still is the point where the, the bullet exits the muzzle with the greatest accuracy. As you can see here, this way here it's pointed to the sky and this way here is pointed down. And sometimes it lets loose when it's in the middle. So when you're firing at a frequency, that's called the frequency of the, the barrel. But when you're, when you're firing at a frequency where the bullet is at more subject to the uh, overtone rather than the node, that's where you have the least accuracy. And that's why, that's why just a simple uh, change of a half a grain in a, in a 30 or 6 size case, like a 270 case or something like that, uh, can affect the accuracy. Uh, and that's why uh, as little as Two, uh, two tenths of a grain or, or three tenths of a grain can have a very similar effect on a, a cartridge case that only holds, say, 20, 25 grains of powder. So two tenths of a grain uh, in that case is the one percent, one percental increase, and that's where you that's where you want to tune in. You want to base it's like it's like tuning into a you know distant FM station. And you, you, you finally find the point where you're right in the middle. Well, where you're in the middle is the same as where you're you know, shooting a gun. And that's why, <clears throat> that's why it's so important to do, to do incremental testing. I, I know that people will very frequently go online and they'll ask people all kinds of questions on the blog sites. I read through these threads and they ask them everything under the sun. There's no question that I haven't seen asked. Some of them are more uh, frequently asked than others. Uh, one, of the more one of the more frequently asked questions has to do with, uh, you know, what powder should I use? Uh, how many grains of powder? What brand of powder? All these things will suddenly come, come flooding in, and within three or four days, you know, the number of answers has grown to several hundred. They're, they're, you couldn't even find the end of the pages. Uh, everybody will, you know, chime in with their two cents worth about, you know, what their favorite 223 load is, what their favorite 45 ACP load is, and they, they, you know, they'll they'll put a big they'll put a big uh, you know smiley face or something, and they they got so many grains of uh, 748 ball powder for their 308 and all that. You can put all that in a hat and burn it. It's worth nothing. It absolutely means nothing. Cardinal rule number one: never, ever, ever get information off the internet, with the exception that it comes from a manufacturer. Uh, you can get this manual right here and everybody else's manual from hydrogen or from, uh, from uh, any of the bulk, most of the bulk manufacturers, uh, unless they're hoarding information so you buy their book or whatever, but most of, the, uh, most of the companies will publish their information online if you go to their website and they have they have a, a PDF or some sort of website that you can go to that will list it. Generally speaking, they'll have you go through a, you know, they'll have you go and answer a specific question before you can answer. It. Are you willing to read all this? Do you understand what you're doing? Are you are you stupid? You know, yes, I'm stupid. So don't go in there. If you're if you're not willing to read directions, this is not this is not a good thing for you. You stick. If you're not willing to read directions, stick with uh, you know the stuff you buy in a box. Now, uh, another another popular uh, another popular question is, and just to go, expand on that, I I'm not even I'm not even certified to issue 
uh, load data online. You're not going to see me issuing load data online. One day I gave an off-the-cuff remark about a favorite load I used with a, three, a 300 Savage, uh, you know, with IMR 4064 powder. But that's not, I, I think I, cl I classified that as being uh, that I don't uh, give load data online and I don't recommend loads. Don't ever listen to anybody's recommended load data. You have no idea where that's coming from, you have no idea whether the source is valid, and you certainly don't have any idea whether it uh, is suitable for your firearm. Uh, stick with, there's, there's far too much published loading data uh, that you should never have to uh, rely on anybody online. Um, it's just as easy to go to a PDF file online and get the, in the information immediately instead of waiting three or four days for all these dopes to pile on with their, with their recommendations. The, uh, the, bet, the, the really best way to do it is to uh, get a more comprehensive guide. I start out with this one right here because this one here is probably the most comprehensive of them all because he compiles all the data from the powder manufacturers. Uh, you know, he has, he has powder manufacturing uh, data published in his book here and he lists it in a very convenient format. He lists it from the highest velocities uh, down to the lowest velocities and within bullet weights and everything. And he also has the first half of this book is just chock a block full of very fascinating information about reloading stuff that you're not going to find any place else. And uh, yes, it has some, it has some uh, brand specific information about his Lee uh, loading dies and everything, which is worth reading because frankly, I've converted all my stuff to, I'm not, I don't represent the company. They couldn't pay me enough for all the, you know, online advertising I've done for them. Uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, I love the stuff because it's very precise. It costs generally 30% uh, less, uh, I should say 30% of what anybody else's dies cost and they're better. Um, they don't require, you know, Allen wrenches and stuff on the lock rings. Uh, they, don't, they don't have poor finishes. Uh, they're more concentric. I, I, I have a concentricity gauge with a Starrett dial on it and I measure the run out of um, my target rounds. And I can tell you that having tried all the different brands on the market, nobody comes close to the, to the degree of precision that I get out of the, uh, the uh, lead eyes on a, uh, on a constant basis, no matter what it is. So, I, you know, that's a good manual. Always, and get the, I recommend that you get the, the various bullet manufacturers' manuals. If you're going to load Hornady bullets, get a Hornady manual. Uh, because you're working with bullets that are with their um, shank uh, density and the shank length, the bearing surface and all that stuff, the hardness of the metal. And if you're, if you're working with nozzle bullets, get a nozzle manual. If you're working with a spear, get a spear manual and so forth. Sierra bullets, get a Sierra manual. You can't have too many of those manuals. And if you're working with the specific bullets, it does change things. Pressures are sometimes aggravating to people because they want hard and fast hands. They want black and white. Well, there's a lot of things that are black and white. Yes, there is a God, and that's, that's black and white, uh, and He loves us. But there are a lot, there, and there's a lot of other absolute truths, too. Um, but with, with regard to loading, uh, what is in one manual is, in, is true, and what is in another manual is true, and they both appear to be completely different. That's the way loading data works, because you're working with rather nebulous figures. You're working with things that are uh, not constant. If, if you load uh, a particular load with a nozzle bullet with a petition in it, uh, that is like it's like an I beam across that across that bullet. You work with that load, and then you then you change and you go maybe to a, a Sierra target bullet, a, you know, that uh, a match bullet which has a soft lead core that has no support and a very thin jacket. You're going to have different pressures, even though the bullet weights may be identical, and even though the form factors may appear to be exactly the same. So, and and the difference in the jump in the throat can be entirely different. So this leads me into uh, this, one of the other big questions that's frequently asked online is whether you can use a uh, 762, I should say a 5.56 NATO cartridge, uh, the military version of the, uh, the M16 cartridge, if you can use that in a 223. Remember this, no, that's the only answer, no, you cannot. 
you can, but you may not. It's not. It you cannot do it without uh, extreme danger. Um, there's a difference in the chambering. You can you can take all the measurements from a 223 cartridge against a military uh, spec uh, NATO cartridge, and they're identical. There's absolutely no difference whatsoever in the cartridge dimensions. The difference, however, is in the chambering and in the and in the pressure specifications that are certified for the gun at hand. NATO cartridges uh, work at pressures of over 12, uh, 10 or 12,000 psi greater than 223 cartridges. Just like when, just like when a uh, military fighter gets into his jet uh, and, he, and, and he pushes the, the afterburners home and his, you know, his engines start glowing and he's using up you know, pounds of fuel per second, he's running at full military power. And that's what the military does with, uh, with rifles too. They run at full military power with the M16. They're running at they're running at pressure levels that are way way uh, at the very top. They can't be exceeded. The way they keep it under control is they use a long what they call a free bore. The bullet has a long jump before it engages the rifling, and even the rifling lead is more shallow so that it doesn't engage abruptly. That's not the type of chamber that's in a 223 designated rifle. A 223 Remington chamber does not have a long lead. It has a very short bullet jump to maintain higher degrees of accuracy. The military is not even concerned about the kind of accuracy that you can get out of a 223. That's not their, that's not their modality. Their modality is to get a bullet out of that gun as fast as they can from a 14-inch uh, M4 and uh, to, to, to run it right up to the ceiling. And they use that free bore to keep the pressures under control. It basically gives the bullet a running start out of the, out of the cartridge case and until it hits, until it engages the rifling gradually. If you crowd that, if you crowd that, and you and you you get two problems going on at the same time, both not good. If you take a, a 223 Remington chamber, which has a very short lead, it have, has a very short bullet jump, and you and you put a NATO cartridge in that, you no longer have that. You no longer have that safety margin that was built in for military cartridges to, to keep the pressures under control. Now the pressures can be running right up through the roof. They can run far beyond uh, what the military would specify as a safe load for their M16s. To make matters worse, the 223 pressure limits are significantly less than the 5.56 NATO cartridge pressure limits. They're entirely different. They're not in the same ballpark whatsoever. Every firearm that's every firearm that's made, each and every one, they're not pulled like one out of five or one out of a dozen out of a, out of an assembly line. Every single one that's fired goes into a, a proof testing chamber, and a proof a, a certified proof tester in that facility uses certified proof loads, which are special loads which are made by Federal or or Remington or whoever it is, whoever the, they contract. They, they get them by the pallets. I've seen this. There's pallets of them at the Ruger factory uh, and at the, at the Remington factory. That's all, the, that's all the proof tester does is he sits there all day and he sticks guns into a, into a cabinet. A, a, basically, it's a bomb-proof cabinet, and he fires those guns all day long. Um, you know, it's kind of a brain-rattling job. I wouldn't want it. Uh, but, but basically, he fires every single chamber with at least one proof load and sometimes more. Sometimes they run a whole magazine through a gun. Uh, and with re in the case of a revolver, they run every single cylinder uh, with a proof load. Those loads are far in excess of the standard industry uh, SAMI pressure. Did, and when a 223 Remington is proof tested, the proof tests are nowhere near as high as the proof tests for a uh, NATO chamber. So nobody can ever say. Uh, there's, no, there's nobody on earth can ever say that that gun was proof tested for a 5.56 NATO round, and they certainly can't say that it was proof tested for a 5.56 NATO round that is running over spec because it has too short a chamber. So never confuse the issue. So again, can you fire a NATO round in a, a 223 chamber? No, don't do it. Don't ask anybody online. There's nobody out there that can possibly give you an answer that's different than that because that's the truth. Now, 
Here's another one that I run across sometimes quite frequently um, with regard to the, the Mini, the Mini 14 ranch rifle. I've seen people get so confused about this. They get, they get all wound up. They, they read this thing here and it says on it, caliber 223, ranch rifle, caliber 223. And so it goes around on the threads. Everybody will chime in with their two cents about, yeah, you can, no, you can't, I do it all the time, no, I wouldn't do it, and so forth and so on. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a funny little thing that comes with guns when you buy it. It's called, it's called the owner's manual. Read it. If I know that the person is not illiterate because he's, he's typing a question, can I shoot, can I shoot NATO stuff in my 223 uh, ranch rifle? And he'll, he'll get all kind, he'll get every kind of answer in the book. If you turn to page, if you turn to the index in this, in this book, it says right here, let's see, turn to page ammunition, it says, it says right here. Nomenclature, ammunition. See where my see where my thumb is. Ammunition. All you do, you turn to the page, and right here, it says ammunition. What does it say about ammunition? Wouldn't that be Wouldn't that be something if somebody actually reads their own manual? You know, it's the it's the American thing to do. You know, read your read your Constitution, read your Declaration of Independence. Know what. Know what's going on. Read your newspaper. Don't just read the crap online. That's, that's not going to get you anywhere. The Ruger Mini 14 Ranch Rifles. Now remember, this is for this series. This is for the series which is applicable to the modern, the modern ranch rifles. If you have one of the older ones, then you, then you contact Ruger, go on their website, and it has under customer support, it has manuals. And you can get owner's manuals, right? You can download them on a PDF file right online. I know you can do it because you're, you're watching this right now. So you just simply do that. You get the, you get the applicable man, manual for uh, the rifle at hand. And if your computer goes down, pick up the phone and call Ruger or call Remington, call Winchester. These companies actually know about their, about their guns. It, it really stymies me that people write online about stuff they think that the manufacturer doesn't have a clue about the gun that he just built, as if he's somehow a, a third party to this, that he doesn't know. The Ruger Mini 14 ranch rifles are offered in two calibers, the 223 Remington, and then it says right in parentheses, 5.56 millimeter cartridge and the 6.8 millimeter Remington SPC. That, that was, this, this was printed back when that cartridge was, that, that rifle was still being uh, made, which is not anymore. And that continues, the Mini 14 Ranch, it already answered the question right there, 5.56 milli, millimeter. 5.56 millimeter is not a cartridge designation that's used in the SAMI specification for the 223 Remington. It says the Mini 14 Ranch and Mini 30 rifles are de designed to use either standardized U.S. military that's the very first thing it says, standardized U.S. military, that means mil-spec, you know, or factory-loaded sporting cartridges manufactured in accordance with U.S. industry practice, that would be S-A-A-M-I. Always be careful to ensure that you, you are using the correct ammunition for your rifle. See ammunition and warning below. Now, and it also says up here, the target model, if you have a target model, the one that's got the bulbous, you know, uh, harmonic adjuster on the front. That uses 223 Remington cartridges only. That answers all the questions. So this is why I'm, I'm only trying, I'm not, you know, I just want you to understand that if, you, if you're looking for credible information, the most credible information you can get is published data. That's what it's published for. And, it's, and most of the time it comes for free. When you get a, when you get a gun from anybody these days, any dealer who sells something these days, they protect, they protect their hind ends like crazy. They have you sign a piece of paper and check off the block. I got a copy of the owner's manual. I will read the owner's manual. I understand that I should read the owner's manual. The owner's manual, that's what they want you to do. Read the owner's manual. It's, it's, not, it's not a bad thing to do, you know. 
Uh, just because it says on the top of the barrel, read the owner's manual, doesn't mean don't read the owner's manual because it's on the, you know, you means you're a dope. It means read the owner's manual. So that's simple as that. Um, stick with loading data. <coughs> now I'm going to move into, I'm going to move into something which is rather, uh, a lot of people find it difficult to understand when somebody's talking about headspace. The simple definition is the head, headspace is the dimension which prevents any forward movement of a cartridge in a chamber. In other words, it's the, it's the, 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 the space that's, that's designated for the length of the cartridge or the, or the uh, distance that pr prevents it from moving forward. Uh, if you have a uh, 38, if you have a 38 special, and you drop a you drop a cartridge into a, into the cylinder, it stops when it gets to the rim. The rim of that cartridge is the headspace. So the back of the headspace is the recoil plate on the uh, behind the cylinder, and the front of the headspace is where the the forward side of the rim. Uh, that was a very popular type of headspace uh, back in back in black powder days because a lot of rifles were single shot barreled rifles and stuff like that uh, and revolvers uh, and, and various various firearms that they just used uh, that form of headspace a very simple type of headspace to achieve too rim fire cartridges are all you know, 22 rim fires that's that's a rimmed uh, headspace so the distances from the always measured no matter what kind of headspace it is measured from the bolt face where the bolt hits, or the bolt or the uh, recoil face of uh, of a car, uh, of a uh, revolver contacts the uh, rear of the, the cartridge. In the case of a rimmed case, the forward edge, the front edge, where it, where it prevents it from going in any farther, that's that's called a rimmed cartridge. Now, don't confuse a rimmed cartridge with a cartridge that has a rim. Uh, a, a rimmed, uh, a, a rimmed cartridge. This is one that's called a rimmed cartridge. Uh, a 3006, uh, a 50, a 50 BMG has, it has a rim on it, but it's not a rimmed cartridge. It's a rimless cartridge. This is called an extractor groove. That's all this is. This is, this, is, this rim here is an extractor groove, but this is a rimless cartridge reason you can call it rimless is because if I put my straight edge up against the um, up against the body of the the cartridge and I, I look it's not being held away by by a rim this 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 extractor groove is this I should say the the rim behind the extractor groove is the same dimension as the rest of the cartridge so there's no that's not going to hold it back this is only used to pull the cartridge out of the chamber when it's completed firing the front, the front of the shoulder, right here, this, this edge of the shoulder right here, there's a point between the neck, the junction of the neck, and the corner of the body. About halfway in between or so, is this, there's a point there which um, is specified in, in the blueprint as the datum line, D-A-T-U-M. That datum line is just a place, it's a, it's a point where a machinist will navigate to so he can set his uh, climber gauge, his climber headspace gauges or his uh, forcer headspace gauges or whatever to set the maximum depth for the, the cartridge uh, involved. So um, he basically uses a, a go, a no-go and a field gauge and he uses those, he uses those gauges to uh, set up the, the minimum and maximum dimensions for a chamber and they have to be adhered to exactly How big is how big is the tolerance between minimum and maximum? It's roughly less. It's, it's roughly about six thousandths of an inch To give you an idea of how thick six thousandths of an inch is if you if you go to your, Go look at your printer right now and pull out a piece of paper. That's four thousand. So if you're using twenty pound, if you're using twenty pound printer paper from Staples, uh, that's four thousandths of an inch thick. If you measure it with a, a pair of calipers, so six thousandths of an inch is just a sheet and a half thick is of of headspace. That's not much. If it's if it's tighter than that, the bolt won't close. If it's looser than that, 
then you have a ruptured case cartridge, a cartridge case. Um, the the various the various problems that can go on with having uh, either one of those situations are too numerous to mention. Um, in the first case, nothing's going to happen because you're not going to you're not going to chamber around. When manufacturers build guns, they, they put the correct headspace in it. It's not something you should ever have to worry about. It. But if you have if you have uh, excessive headspace, in other words, if a, if a cartridge gets to the point where it can move too far forward when the primer when the primer is struck by the firing pin, the, what happens is the firing pin the firing pin strikes the cartridge. It moves the whole cartridge forward by that six thousandths of an inch, up to six thousandths. It may be less than that. Remember, that's only a that's only a that's only a min max specs. So it can be it can be less than that. But whatever it is, it'll move it forward uh, until it contacts the headspace, whether it's on the rim or whether it's on the shoulder, and it stops there. The the firing pin continues to crush the primer and ignite it. At the, at the moment that the primer ignites, the inside starts burning, and then it it expands. It immediately expands the case wall tightly against the chamber. In other words, it, it acts like a gasket. It immediately expands it tight against the chamber. This part of the case right here. This is a tapered section of the case. It gets thick, thinner and thinner as it goes toward the front. This expands. It immediately adheres to the walls of the chamber, and this is why you should never ever use any kind of lubricant in a chamber. Don't ever allow oil to get in your chamber because it interferes with this process. It has to be able to stick and adhere to that uh, chamber wall tightly. That's what prevents hot gases uh, from, from going back, and I'll talk about that. But what it adheres in a sticks, it's not going to go any farther. It's going to stay right there. At that time, the, the, the primer is immediately pushed out and it's pushed out by whatever the headspace was so it might it might back out two or three or four or five thousandths of an inch but it'll back out a little bit because the 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 hot gases are pushing on it from inside so it backs the primer up and then Im immediately afterwards then the case the, the case can't move because it's it's stuck but the back of the the back of the head which is thicker this section here does not expand because it's, this is solid brass right down in here. This, this, this behind what's called this is this is usually called a pressure ring. You can you can sometimes see it when you when you fire a cartridge case. You'll see a bulge right there. That's the pressure ring. That's where that's where the uh, chamber of the cartridge actually begins. This section here is solid brass, so it cannot normally expand. So what happens is this travels back and this this expand this this lengthens right here. This section right here at the pressure ring that lengthens. It's, it's like a it, it's like a bungee cord. It just it just pops and it fills the difference in the headspace. So suddenly your cartridge your cartridge case where where when you loaded it 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 could bobble back and forth by six thousandths of an inch. Now it's absolutely snug fit, uh, and it comes out of the cartridge it comes out of the chamber as a snug fit. When it when it the reason why a primer flattens is because when it and, and you get you you actually if you take the primer out of a, a flattened primer out of a case, you'll notice that it has a mushroom shape to it. The the upper edge of it has got a mushroom curve to it. It looks like a little rimfire cartridge case, uh, and that's because that that got pinched as the as the brass was slamming back against the bolt face. It pinched the primer before without the primer actually seating back into position. Instead of the primer sliding back in, it actually got pinched and so it flattens it. The danger of, the danger of having a uh, ruptured primer or a, uh, a ruptured case cannot be, cannot be overstated. Uh, the, the gas pressures that are involved with such small orifices can really, really damage your gun. You can cut, you can cut your bolt all to pieces. Uh, and you know, I actually, uh, I, I'll tell you now. Don't ever use 
corrosive ammo in a, in a modern rifle. There's no need to whatsoever. You can give me all the thumbs down that you want. You can send me all the nasty replies you want. I'm just simply going to, I'm just going to ignore you because I can tell you corrosive primers were something which went out in 1950. We don't need them anymore. I don't care how cheap they are, you, you, you're destroying your gun. And never, be, because corrosive primers use chlorate, in other words, salt in them. There's, there's, there's salt in them, and that salt and mercury will disintegrate uh, your brass, and it also will disintegrate your, your bore. It, it, it causes immediately, it immediately crystallizes on the bore of your rifle, and I don't care what you do to clean the rifle, it will immediately begin to, to etch it and to, and to start digging into it. No, no serviceman uh, ever was able to get his, uh, the salt out of his barrel completely. His, the, the, the primers eventually uh, corroded the inside of the barrel to the point where, uh, you know, anybody who deals with Garands knows that if you take, if you take the, the point of a, if you take the point of a uh, cartridge of, of, a, of a bullet and put it in the end of a Garand, if you've got one that goes all the way up to the, all the way up to the uh, case mouth, you know that the rifling is toast, it's gone, and that's, and that doesn't even, that, that, that's, that's at the end of the barrel. Back at the chamber, it's even bigger than that. So it really does destroy, and, and believe me, the military makes everybody clean their guns on a regular basis. That's what you got to do if you're in the Army or in the Marines. So don't use, don't use corrosive primers. And the second thing is don't ever collect previously fired corrosive ammo and use it for reloading. That's absolutely don't do it. Uh, we're not talking about speculation here. I'm telling you right now. If you want to, if you want to damage your chamber, or if you want to thrust a bolt back in your face, use previously loaded uh, corrosive brass. Because what's going to happen is, it crystallizes the brass the instant it's fired. The brass inside becomes brittle, and so the next time, or the time after that, maybe the second or third time that you reload it, you're going to separate your case right here, and it's going to etch, it's going to cut a gas ring around you inside of your chamber and you're going to really be saddened about it because you're going to have, you're going to go from having a, a, a nice 30 6 that had a smooth chamber to having one that has an annular ring inside and that creates extraction problems because all your brass from that point on is going to flow into that ring and it's going to, it's going to scrape, it's going to scrape off brass in order to get it out. Don't do it. So uh, I don't want to sound like, I, I don't want to sound like somebody who knows it all, but these are things I do know and I don't want you to I don't want you to go down a garden path with all these with all these promotions, people who have you know, I know it's out there and it looks very inviting. You go into a gun store now and it will have a mountain of, you know, uh, ammunition from some former Soviet bloc country that, you know, has been released on the scene or some Chinese ammo or something. That stuff is just so much junk. It's the reason we stopped using that in 1950, you know, 65 years ago, 66 years ago, the military stopped using it and the, the commercial world, uh, you know, in this country, people in this country stopped using it and they rejoiced. I mean, they could have been dancing down the street because they were so happy. They finally had ammunition that wouldn't uh, get their, damage their guns. That was a big deal when that came out, you know, for, for, for over 30 years it said non-corrosive prime, they finally, I think, stopped advertising the fact there's non-corrosive primers on the box, but that was a huge deal and uh, is something you should always keep in mind. The other two types of, the other two types of um, headspace are found in, commonly, in, uh, here's a 45 ACP case. It's a rimless design. It's got the extraction groove, but it has the from from here back. It, it looks just like a 308 or a 3006. It's the same thing. It's it's got a straight it's got a straight uh, rim that will not catch when it goes into a chamber. Uh, that's so that it can cycle through a magazine. Rims cause problems cycling through a, a stacked uh, magazine. So in, and there are certain guns that have that problem, such as the the 220 Swift has a magazine, you've got to be sure you stack all your rounds one in front of the other because if you don't, the, the top round will hang up and it won't, it won't uh, load. So what they do is, the, the headspace is at the, the mouth of the case. 
the mouth of the case comes to a dead stop at the end of the chamber, and that's the headspace. So the, the, the headspace of a 45 and a 9 millimeter and a 380 and uh, 40 Smith & Wesson, these all, these all are between the, the bolt face from the head of the cartridge case to the front of uh, the case mouth. And uh, that's, that's how that particular one works. <clears throat> a belted magnum, here's a 300 Winchester magnum. A belted magnum case is a rimmed cartridge. It's a thick rim. This, this, the belt itself is a thick rim. So think of it as a rimmed cartridge. It does not, it does, even though it has a configuration of a 3006 up front and a 223 and all those, the, uh, the, there, is, there is no headspace to the front of the cartridge. The headspace is against the end of the belt. With the belt, where the belt hits the chamber, that's where it stops. So think of a uh, belted magnum case as a uh, rimmed, a thick rimmed cartridge with a uh, extraction group built into the rim. So that's how that works. Um, there are certain there are certain issues with the um, belted magnums that have always been well known. I, I mentioned how when when the case pops where, where the, the head jumps back to meet the bolt face. That, that, happens with all, that happens with all fully resized cases fired in a, uh, in a chamber because there's a, there has to be a little bit of slop otherwise you know, you're not going to be sure to get your bolt uh, closed. Um, and you know, it allows for even having perhaps a, you know, a cartridge that you took out of your pants that's wet or something. And wetness is not a problem, you know, a, a wet cartridge case will still stick to the inside of the chamber, but an oily case won't. So don't worry about moisture. But a, a, a wet, a, but you can't fire a gun underwater, I don't care what the ad showed, no, you know, that's an obstructed bore if you're looking to damage your gun. Um, but when, you're, when your cartridge case uh, sticks to the front and you're using a belted magnum, if you've overly resized that, case. You have to be very careful that your dies are within spec. Some people have done things with, with dies that have not uh, been adjusted properly and have, uh, you know, sometimes with inexpensive dies, uh, they may overly resize the case and force the shoulder back a few thousands more than it ought to be. And it causes excessive, it causes excessive stretch at, at the web. It causes excessive stretch Right here at the at the pressure ring, and that and that will uh, very quickly uh, signal a, a you'll, you'll end up after a, two or three loadings you'll have a bright white line after you fired it right around that right around that pressure ring, and that that web uh, that stretching of the web is very very hazardous because uh, belted magnums are known to separate uh, their more than any other type of cartridge because people over, they oversize them so. Uh, make sure, remember, it's not, it's not being, it, it doesn't have the limitations of the datum line up here. It, the, the, the front of the cartridge is hanging out there. It can, it can stretch a lot more than it would if it was a, uh, and still fire, it, than if it was a, uh, say, a 30 or 6 or something. So, uh, those, are all, those are all concerns that we want to keep in, in mind as we move along in our loading. So, the most important thing, if I can say it uh, a thousand times, is get a loading manual. Don't, don't wait to get a loading manual. If you, really, if you want to load, you really have to have an owner's manual. You have to know what you're doing. You have to know what the, the designated powders are for individual cartridges. You have to know what the specified uh, powder charges are with individual cartridges and all that. Loading for, loading for rifle cartridges and handgun cartridges is all very, very simple. This is not, it really isn't rocket science. But, you know, just because it's simple, that doesn't mean everybody can bake a pie. You know, it still requires knowledge, and you, it still requires that you adhere to certain, uh, to certain practices, which are the same practices that have to be adhered to by uh, the factory when it manufactures the ammunition. You're doing the same thing. Uh, and you don't you don't have any latitude with this stuff. It's not this is not this is not a game. You're really playing with extremely uh, dangerous products that that can uh, take your head off. Um, the, um, the the best the best thing to do I, again is is to get to get one of these. Get one of these. Um, I would say get yourself get yourself eventually 
all the loading manuals. If you can afford to get into reloading, uh, you, you, you're saving yourself a lot of money. These, these books here cost what a, a box of cartridges would cost, but they're invaluable because these will last many, many thousands of times longer than any cartridge that you ever buy. So no matter what cartridge that you're going to be loading for, it gives handy information about everything. It gives handy, and plus a lot of pictures to look at and stuff. Uh, it, it shows you the cartridges, it shows you the dimensions, it shows you how you, the lengths that you need to trim your cases to, and that's the sort of thing that we'll get into. Uh, it shows you your, uh, the, the various loading densities. Uh, it, it'll even give you, in this one here, it'll actually give you what they thought was their, what they found, at least in their rifle, with their cartridges to be uh, the best uh, suitable um, load. <clears throat> As you go through those manuals, don't just pick out the manual that say that, that gives you the highest loading data because that doesn't mean a thing. Uh, a lot of people, I noticed online that a lot of people tend to do that. They see, they see that, well, just as for instance, maybe Spears data seem to be higher velocities than Lyman data, or maybe Nozzle's data is higher velocity than Sierra data, you know, and I'm not given, there's no there's no give and take here. This is all a matter of this is all a matter of laboratory testing. Every single every single uh, piece of data that each of these manufacturers, each of these manuals come up with, is specifically for the tested product that they use, for the for the bullet they use, for the powder they use, for the charges they use, for the case internal dimension capacity that they use. Uh, and all these different variables, the, the variables go on and on. There's, there's, at least, there's at least a half a dozen or more variables that can play into the velocities that you achieve at any given time. So just because, just because for instance, maybe Sierra might list uh, a charge weight of two grains more for a given case and uh, throw a velocity that's another 75 or 100 feet per second greater than, say, Nozzle or a Spear or something like that, does not mean that uh, nozzle and Spears data is is corrupt or they don't know what they're doing. Everybody's arriving at the same pressures with the same laboratory equipment but with different with different components and that's why uh, there's so many variables in different size chambers you know there's, there's different there's different leads there's different bullet jumps which which uh, affect uh, internal case capacity and everything else. You'd be surprised how varied internal case capacity can be from one a cartridge case to another and you know just getting a, a case that has uh, more capacity doesn't mean that it's going to be allowing you a greater latitude in pressure because what happens is uh, the case suddenly it doesn't have as much strength so the pressure levels have to be kept down a little bit more uh, so everything you know what you take away from one you have to give to the other and vice versa there's always a give and take with regard to uh, all these all these variables so but there is no give and take when it comes to what the data is that they have in their manuals. If they, if they say that they arrived at 3,120 feet per second for a particular 223 load using such and such a powder, that's what they got. And just because some other manufacturer or some other publisher got a different result using what appears to be similar data, I can guarantee you something is different. Either a different primer, uh, different bullet construction, uh, different internal uh, case capacity or whatever. But there's, there's always a rhyme and reason for this. So don't be searching for the manual that gives you always, it l looks like it has, uh, you know, uh, greater velocity or something. And please, the velocity stuff is, is far less important than the accuracy stuff. You know, it, in any given day, I'll take, a, I'll take a load that's more accurate over a load that's more powerful. Uh, that's just the way. That's just the way guns work. You can't. You can't hit them with the head stamp of the cartridge. You have to hit them with the bullet. So, uh, regardless of what it says on the cartridge case, uh, you know you want to. You want to be sure that that you're staying within the parameters of accuracy and efficiency. So I think I think I've covered everything with regard to um, with regard. Well, I just want to one more thing. Um, when. When you have when you have a uh, cartridge loaded, one of the things that tends to raise pressures is you'll have you'll have individuals that you'll that you'll find online that will recommend to you that you seat the bullet tight against the rifling to get the best accuracy or so many thousands apart and everything. Um, if you're if you're 
if you've been loading for a while and you understand pressure signs and you understand what you're dealing with and if you're a target shooter and you want to eke out the last eighth of an inch of uh, group size and make your group size smaller and stuff, maybe you can, maybe you can get up to the point where you uh, gently uh, touch the rifling. Uh, but that's not something you should ever do for a field rifle or a field gun because what's going to happen is you're going to end up jamming a guaranteed. Someday you're going to jam a bullet in that rifling and when you go to extract it, it's gonna come, the, the case is going to come out, the powder is going to fall in the magazine and the bullet's going to stay in the barrel and you're in a mess out in the field. Uh, it's, it's not worth the extra eighth of an inch of accuracy and that's, that's all stuff which is not necessarily always true. I, I know the bench rest game and some rifles perform when they have uh, the bullet against the rifling and some rifles perform better when the bullet is back from the rifling. Concentricity is something we'll talk about and show you how you can achieve that without having to use the rifling to achieve the concentricity. That was a trick that was used when, ki when people want to basically cheat on the, an issue. They, want, they didn't have co uh, concentric uh, ammunition. The ammunition was, you know, bent and wobbled all over the place because their dies are bad. So the way they can kind of cheat is to run, run the bullet into the barrel, into the rifling, and that puts it in a concentric mode. But if you have concentric ammunition to begin with, you don't have to worry about that. And we're gonna we're gonna approach that stuff for those of you who are accuracy minded. But we're gonna talk more about uh, just getting you going and uh, learning how to do the basics, uh, how, to, how to assemble ammunition and how to uh, be a, a very good loader, how to be a good uh, a safe loader and to have practical ammunition that you always can count on. This is that's as reliable as the ammunition that you buy at a factory and generally speaking can be uh, even better because it, it's stuff that you picked out from the get-go. It's your, the bullets that you want to use and everything else and it's your accuracy. So um, I think we'll we'll cover we'll cover more in depth about uh, what to what to buy uh, in the next video. Thank you. God bless.